Sambha Sambhudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambhudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambhudasa Udang Dhammang Sangang Namasami So today, I was hoping to continue the talk which I began last week on wise attention, or appropriate attention in Pali, uh, which is a term that in Pali is yoni so manasikara. Yoni is derived from the word for womb, and manas is the intellect. Kara means action. So, manasikara is action of the intellect or intention, or attention. And yoniso means attention which goes to the heart of the matter. Appropriate, wise attention. I think this term this term's relationship to that word for womb is relevant in another sense. In that in Buddhist conception, our, what we give attention to shapes and births our world. And in that sense, Our attention is a womb for the world that we walk in because it's the world, it's what gives rise to the world that we inhabit. In the cycle of dependent origination, which is the most uh, complex of the psychological frameworks the Buddha lays down, the chain of factors by which we create suffering, beginning with ignorance, moves through several, including uh, volitional constructs, consciousness, name and form, the sense bases, and so on. The important thing to note, though, is that before contact of the senses with the external world is made, in this framework, there's about five steps, which means that we come into the world and we contact the world already primed to suffer or to find peace in that world, depending on what we are looking for what we give attention to. And this is why yoni so manasikara is so essential, appropriate or wise attention. Because where we place our gaze determines not just the world that we see and walk in, but eventually our own hearts because they arise in dependence on that world. It's Hegel, I believe, who said that evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. And I've spoken frequently about coming back to the US from Thailand on election night and finding that even though the people in my life their conditions hadn't changed all that much day to day. They were still surrounded by loving relationships and an enormous amount of goodness. And yet, because of constantly checking the news cycle day in and day out, because of legitimate fears around different things in the world, but fears that had been blown out of proportion to the point where they eclipsed 
all the goodness which still existed, even though people's situations were similar to when I had left, their worlds were completely different, and their hearts were too. There was a heaviness and a depression and a rawness and an anger. So when we move out into the world, we are frequently primed for our, what we're going to see. And usually those, what we call sankara, those programs which we are carrying into the world of perception of what we're creating are ones of aversion or hatred or ones of greed or ones of delusion. And this is when you watch the person who you've had an argument with the previous day come in and react immediately. Or those days when you are just looking for something to be angry at or grumpy about and you'll find something. We create that world. The person next to you will be chewing too loudly or one interesting thing about coming back to the West was uh, seeing how people could find so many things to be annoyed with at meditation retreats. And that, my med uh, you know, either the person's breathing too loudly or they talk a little bit or they chew with their mouth open. And this was funny because in Thailand, uh, there was one monk in my monastery who had really, really intense Tourette syndrome. So we'd be meditating and then these expletives would just be floating across the lawn. And it was fine. You know, you sort of get used to it. Or there was a pack of dogs that would routinely bark during our chanting, and you get used to it. And it just shows how the, if we want to find something wrong with the world, we will. And it's easy to flow in that vein. And yet we forget the bright guard in our hands working for the faint vis whisper of a serpent. And Ajin Kovilo and I were talking last Wednesday about a conversation we'd had in the past where we tried to figure out what makes, and this was actually the conversation on Wednesday as well, what makes a routine existence in the world practice in the Buddhist sense. And in the middle-length discourses, the Buddha says that all factors of the path, of the Eightfold Path, uh, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration, all stem from three distinct factors circling around them, right view, right intention and right, oh, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. And those three things together, Ajahn Tanisro says are attention. And it's, so whatever we move into the world, however, whatever experiences we encounter in the world, depending on if we have those factors present, if we're approaching them with wisdom, these experiences and these circumstances, these relationships, then they become one more factor of the path. Um, or they become just another experience um, which can issue into suffering. Um, and this can apply to wholesome un or things that are ex sort of obviously unwholesome in our lives. Um, we can transform them into good or bad, depending. I'm reminded uh, in Thailand, it's very common for villagers to try to get lottery numbers from the monks. So they'll ask you what, you know, if you had any dreams last night with certain numbers in them. And Ajahn Shah famously refused to give out these numbers. But then uh, I believe the day he passed away, um, Perhaps it was the date of his passing away, but all the villagers took out lottery tickets with that number and they all won. And they said it was Ajahn Chah's final gift <laughs> or joke. Um, 
And a monastery I know named Anandagiri bought a large Bodhi tree and um, they found out how much it weighed and all the villagers took out lottery numbers on its weight and they all won as well actually. But this is an example of looking to something very wholesome and maybe turning it into something a little bit less so. I would say that would be an instance of inappropriate attention, although a fun one if that. So, the, uh, in the book Buddha Dhamma, which I referenced last week, uh, the P.A. Piyuto, this scholar monk, lays out these different uses of appropriate attention. And they are to look at things in terms of their component parts, which is where you, instead of looking at something as a discrete uh, entity that you can feel just easy aversion towards or uh, greed towards, um, a very low resolution model of the world. You parse things up into their constituent uh, elements and that helps take away some of its gravity and it also helps you interact with it in a more refined way. You can find the good parts about a relationship and emphasize those. You can stop feeding the negative parts about another relationship or your own personality habits. The second use is to look at things in terms of conditionality. How we become the people we are. What gave rise to our particular strengths and our weaknesses, our stumblings, our neuroses, and those of the people around us. And this is unbelievably helpful. In a sense, all the damage we do in the world, it's the analogy that's given is if you're wandering through the supermarket and someone bumps into you and knocks the bags out of your hand and you feel the surge of anger, but then you turn around and find that they are blind and you're completely, your whole stance is completely changed. And in the Buddhist conception, because all of our negative personality traits and actions stem from ignorance, we're all just a bunch of blind people with grocery bags bumping into each other. And this is, looking at things in terms of conditionality is very practicable. We all have that experience of seeing how, you know, of, of having someone in our lives who we just don't understand how they can act so unwholesomely. And then you find out what happened to them as a kid or what they're going through at home, or the divorce, or the abuse, or the sickness. And suddenly, there's that sense of, of course, of course they're like that. And you can touch compassion. You can do this for yourself, too. So many of our programs and our personality traits we wish we could let go of are just leftover survival mechanisms. And they may have saved us when we were young, and they've stuck around. But to understand where they come from allows us to feel compassion for ourselves because it taps into that initiating wound. And we see how we too are conditioned. And we also see how our good qualities are conditioned and come into being. And in that sense, there's a huge amount of gratitude. And we realize that in a sense, these good qualities in us aren't ours to waste. We've been given a gift, and it's our responsibility to carry it on and to emphasize and nourish it so that that gift can be given to another. We've been given a precious gem in every one of our beautiful qualities, in this teaching, in our practice of meditation, in everything. And in this sense, conditionality is equivalent to gratitude and duty because we don't have the right to drop that on the ground it's not ours to do that with the next use is to look at things in terms of the four noble truths and i spoke of this last time uh, these truths which are so often misinterpreted or mistranslated or translated without the full context, center around this movement of looking towards our suffering, 
and placing hands on it so that we can feel its shape and stop running from it constantly. And when we do that, not only do we begin to see and let go of those habits which are rife with suffering, but we begin to let go into a brighter place a peace, which is the third noble truth. We've become sensitive to it. I heard a study recently where uh, researchers told participants they had to go into an empty room for 20 minutes and that they couldn't fall asleep and they just had to be there. And then they put a device in the room that if you pressed a button, it delivered a really painful shock. And within a few minutes, most people got bored enough that they just started shocking themselves for no reason. I think this is a pretty dang, uh, da damning indictment of our culture. And it shows how so much of the suffering we create, we don't completely see. And stimulus is taken as our baseline is one of suffering. What this study says is that sitting alone with yourself is worse than shocking yourself with electricity. So how do we, using the Four Noble Truths, little by little, not only let go of those mind states of suffering, but develop states of mind which let us live in a home, in a mind, in a heart that is beautiful and bright? How do we find our way back to Eden? The fourth use of appropriate attention is to look at things in terms of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and not self. And so often this can be seen as a slightly morbid recollection, but really all it is is trying to stop us reaching into the world that is a liquid and hoping to find a solid we still interact with the world, but we do it gently and with a sense of levity, comedy, and skill. Ajahn Shah would say, look, we still pick up things, but we do it lightly, and then we place them back down when it's time. And the problem is when we don't know the limits of what the world can give us, and we try to feed on it and seek refuge in it. And then when it breaks, our hearts break because we've tied ourselves to it. So this path is one of when one sees that fragility and disintegration of everything around us, then we stop looking to it for refuge and cultivate an internal refuge and sustenance of this path. And then we can move into the world with that internal resource and approach it with an intention to give and to bless that world, rather than trying to feed off of it. But to do that first, we do need to see and reflect on its impermanence, on how it's shifting and on how it's not worthy of calling ourselves, of taking ownership over. This is the three characteristics. So we covered those last time. The next use of appropriate attention outlined in the book is looking at things in terms of principles and goals. And the word in Pali is Dhamma, which means, um, say, a principle of practice or a statement or a truth, and Atta, which is the goal or benefit or purpose of that. This is important to look at, to use our appropriate attention to see this. Because even though we take on the forms of a practice of this path, they can still lead us through inappropriate attention into a world that is one of suffering again. If they're not used in their proper place, and if we forget their goal. So, for example, 
the practice of morality, of ethics, which is a Buddhist principle. But if we fail to connect this teaching and this practice with the overarching teaching of the Buddhist path, which is freedom and care, then we can become attached to that principle in itself while forgetting its goal and its, the way that it merges and accords with the robust and comprehensive structure of the teachings. So that's when it becomes something we use to elevate ourselves and disparage others. That's when it becomes attachments to rites and rituals. That's when it becomes a point of pride in the worldly sense. And this is inevitable to an extent because when we begin to practice, there is this sense of internally we're pushing away from who we were and inevitably that gets projected outwards. And there's a place for that too, you know, in, in seeing that maybe those people we used to spend time with or those actions we used to partake in no longer fit. And it's a tall order to expect ourselves to see that with complete equanimity. Usually there's a pushing away that occurs. But as practitioners, it is our job to note that and to not buy into it even as we make those distinctions, and even as we do take concrete steps to step away from those things which are no longer worthy, that we no longer feel worthy of us. Ajahn Jeff would say that we must learn to be judicious, if not judgmental. And this is a great practice, is Ajahn Cha would also say you should spend about 90% of your time looking at yourself and 10% looking at others. And there's so many rules in the Vinaya around when you can admonish other people. Um, the Vinaya is the monk's code. And basically, before we can admonish another person, we have to ask permission. We have to have a heart of genuine goodwill. We have to be free from fault ourselves. That's a tall order. We have to... Uh, find the right time and the right place, and we have to speak truth. And I know Ajahn Amaro has waited an entire year before he could say that all those conditions were met, and he was able to talk to another monk. But what this does is it lets us, it puts a really strong speed bump in the way of us venting our spleen, so to speak. Because so much of our admonishment of others, or our quote-unquote friendly advice, actually stems from this place of aversion and some, some pride. And if we can time and again swallow that and let the person find their way a little bit, this is humbling and filled with humility. And frequently, if they're a practitioner, they will catch themselves. So that's just one way that if we separate the principle from the goal, namely the principle of, say, good morality or this practice or a path which we feel is elevated and transcendent compared to with what we used to pursue, when disassociated from the wider goal of the teaching of humility, of love, of care, it can become a problem. And the Buddha said that the taste, just as one, the ocean had one taste, that of salt, so the teaching has one taste, and that's the taste of freedom. So you can really measure these practices you take on by what they initiate in you, what feeling of freedom, what's the tenor in them. You know, so frequently, maybe there's an ascetic practice that one wants to take on, or one pushes oneself in a certain way, or violently cuts oneself off from an old relationship. And just noting the quality of that action, how it feels in the heart. Does it have the taste of freedom? Does it have the taste of freedom from suffering and of peace? And if it doesn't, then there's a chance that even if the explicit action itself seems domic, perhaps the goal has been forgotten. Perhaps it's not being used 
used in service of where it's supposed to be. One of the most beautiful suttas I think the Buddha speaks to around this is called the Volition Sutta. And it's in the Numbered Discourses, 10.2. And the Buddha says, for one of good morality, there's no need to exert a volition. May I be free from remorse. It is natural that one with good morality is free from remorse. Namely, good morality, its goal, its purpose is freedom from remorse. For one free from remorse, there is no need to exert a volition. May joy arise in me. It is natural that joy arises in one who is free from remorse. And it goes on, rapture is the goal of joy. Tranquility is the goal of rapture. Unification, oh, pleasure, happiness is the goal of tranquility. Concentration, unification of mind is the goal of happiness. Knowledge and vision are the goal of unification of mind. Release is the goal of knowledge and vision. And knowledge and vision of release is the goal of release. That last one's a little confusing. But just to say that there should be this steady, we tend to tie ourselves up in such knots and if we can see how each of these pieces fits into the whole, then you can let this progression move slowly and little by little. And Ajahn Suchito says that, you know, this Dhamma teaching, it's sort of like, it's very strong medicine. And so often we want to take the whole bottle of pills and just down it all at once, and that's not a way to good health. So really letting oneself be gentle and noticing when as we approach each of these individual practices or dhammas or purposes of the path, pieces of the path, if that quality of, you know, what the quality of effort's like, if it's too violent, if it's neurotic, if it's intense in a way that's not wholesome. And you just have to get a good feel for this over time. We overshoot. This practice is one mistake after the other. But it's important, you know, like, Frequently, people come into monasteries at first, you just try to sit and walk as many hours a day as you can. And there's benefit to pouring yourself into practice, but it can become a driven and driving ethic that for many Westerners is like mixing acid with acid. And there's a lot to be said for noticing the flavor of that effort noticing that it's not in line with the overarching goal of the path of freedom, of peace, and just softening. And I think it's safe to assume most of us, as people raised in this culture, lean towards that sharp edge and that brutal effort and that self-recrimination. So, so often the ethic and the language we need to look for in our practice and look to is warmth, care, softening, flourishing. It can become a mantra, warmth, care, softening, flourishing. What part of our practice isn't that? And there's a place for that ascetic edge sometimes, but don't get carried away. And there's a place for solitude sometimes, but as isolated, what my parents call the frozen people of middle class America, some of us, you know, there's a lot to be said for coming into community and building those bonds. And frequently that's our middle path. The Buddha was teaching in a different context. The villages were tightly knit, people felt loved. We are alienated and distant and so often we do not feel loved. So our middle path is going to be different and we've got to be very wary and careful to make sure every one of those dharmic principles is in line with the overarching goal of light, warmth, and care. <laughs>
The next use is one looks at phenomena, one's life in terms of the advantage, the disadvantage, and the escape. And this is called the gratification triad in Buddhism. And it's a very useful tool because so often we'll know with a negative mind state that arises what's wrong with it. We'll know when we become enraged how we feel the next day, how it hurts, how it burns. But we can't give it up because we haven't seen the other two elements. We haven't seen, first of all, the pleasure it gives us. The Buddha compares anger. He says, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. And even though it burns when it comes up, that sense of self-righteous anger is intoxicating. And so much of our creation of a self, of a sense of self, is about orienting ourselves in the world. And one can see how much ignorance is present, how much craving, how much defilement, by how solid that sense of self is when it arises. And self-righteous anger gives rise to the most cohesive, powerful sense of self of almost any emotion. And it's important to mention that when this sense of self isn't arising, it's not a blank coldness that manifests, but rather a soft, careful voice that is gentle and loving and wise. It's the voice of mindfulness and of the heart. So seeing the draw, the addiction, the reason we be continually become angry, or the reason we continually do that same old thing that we know we should stop, the reason we keep going back to that same relationship or that same show is important as well, because only when we understand what, why we keep going to it to feed can we give it up. And that third element is seeing the escape, which is that even though, even if in our lives we see, say, the danger of an unwholesome mind state and its draw, if there's nowhere else to go, if we don't know another path, then we can't give it up. And this is why it's so important to cultivate spiritual friendships, a daily meditation practice that is robust and skilled and pleasant, to start bringing more and more wholesome states into one's life. It's the escape. Otherwise, we are just Plato's prisoner, seeing that the shadows on the wall are just shadows on the wall. We've got to also turn our head towards the light that rests behind us. And this is also why it's so important to go on retreat. I think this is the biggest missing puzzle piece in so many practitioners' lives, is we cultivate daily practice. We have a sense of the beauty of the Dhamma, and yet we can't give up those same habits. And to be fair, Ajahn Chah says that 80% of the practice is knowing we should give something up and not being able to, which is comforting. Um, but the chance to really step out of our lives even for two days a month, or two days every two months, and step into a quiet place, a monastery, a retreat center, and get some perspective on the water we swim in, changes so much. I can't tell you how many times I've had friends step into a retreat environment and suddenly a latent understanding has a chance to speak finally. Um, I had one friend who was working a nonprofit uh, job after college at a desk, and by all accounts, a fairly good job. But then he went to Deer Park for three days, realized he was miserable, and became a carpenter. For me, it took five minutes um, driving down the 101, listening to Top 40 Radio, radio Dan Savage, uh, eating Taco Bell, and various things, looking into, you know, when I was a layman after college, just distracting myself every way I can, could. And then I stepped into a Bayagiri silence, the monastery, for five minutes. And I knew that I needed that to turn towards what was haunting me and to live a life worthy of my death. So 
these resources are more available than people realize. Birkin, Ajahn Sona's monastery, is only a few hour drive, hours drive north. Abayagiri in California will host you and take you in for as long as you can stay and for free. For free. And uh, Servasti Abbey, north of Spokane, um, you can go stay at as well. If Clear Mountain was more than a website and me and a hut, then we would also help, help you. <laughs> um, but this is an important intuition of the escape. Because the Buddha says that even though one is attached to sensual pleasures and knows the, the drawbacks of them, if one does not discern, discern an escape from them, then they cannot step back. Then they cannot move away from those. And even in the good things, you know, seeing the drawbacks of them. There's a famous, uh, Ajahn Jeff references a comic where there's these cows, and one cow looks up and he says, wait, this is grass, we're eating grass. And I think a lot of our lives could be that moment of like really realizing what we're feeding on and what we're taking as worthy of us. So it's seeing the drawbacks too. When I came back to the West, Ajahn Siri Panya said, look, the news is dire right now, but you can hear about it and even watch it a little bit, a little bit. But your job is to not let it give rise to even one unwholesome mind state. And because the Dhamma is simply the teaching of reality, of what it's like. At its most basic, the simple fact that we exist in a vortex of changing conditions and that we can't seek refuge in them, but have to look to a brighter and more stable refuge. Because this is reality, then every situation has a lesson to teach us. And there's some way of looking at it through a dharmic lens which lets it be not a hindrance to the path, and an initiator of negative mind states, but one more step on the path, and one more means of giving birth to a world which is beautiful and bright. And we do need to know our limits. Um, it takes skill, centeredness, and mindfulness to apply appropriate attention to different things. So there's a very big place for just turning off the news for a time, or at most checking, say, you know, the world news every, once every two weeks or something. Um, there's a place for stepping back from relationships are which are negative. And then when we do have the proper solidity and stableness of heart, then you can reapproach them. And you know your limits by the fact if you are unable to maintain mindfulness with a certain situation or person or relationship or news feed, then you know you need to step back until you can move into it with appropriate attention. But if we can do this, then every situation has a thread of Dhamma that runs through it. And there's about four more ways of finding that thread that we don't have time to talk about today. So that'll be for tomorrow or next week. Thank you. Okay. Do uh, people, it's good to see old and new faces. We can, I think we have time just for, announcements ran a little long last week, so maybe we could um, do one or two questions that people have or want to speak on, if anyone has something they'd like to speak about. <laughs> 
It says release of discernment, skilled in release of discernment. The, um, so the question is, there's a line in chanting which the questioner, on the Four Noble Truths, that the questioner remembers as one is skilled in release of awareness and perhaps skilled in a release of discernment or something along those lines. And just wondering if I could talk about the, what release of discernment might mean. Or the dis distinction between a word. Uh, release, but release specifically of awareness. So yeah, the question about uh, release, um, is release liberation with maybe a capital L or is it sort of some smaller process that we're pointing to? So the word nibbana means cooling, and it was a really colloquial term back in the Buddha's time. You know, uh, we hear these Pali terms and they seem, they have gravitas, but in the Buddha's time you just, you put out soup to nibbana. And I think it's useful to remember that in terms of the ultimate goal, the Buddha used not just a verb, you know, cooling, but um, a very simple and uh, common thing that people could kind of get a sense for. So in this case, obviously, the term isn't uh, nibbana, it's, it's release, and I don't know exactly what Pauline term that would be. Um, but the mati vimuti, vimuti, and the point being that this idea of release, just as um, you know, this term nibbana was so applied to all these little things in people's lives, and, and make no mistake, like nibbana with a capital M, and and in Buddhism is you know ultimate release of the heart towards a dimension that's beyond anything we know, but um, that that experience of release can be experienced little bit by little bit in these li small, in, in everything. We know what that feels like and we get a taste of it. So, you know, it's just that sense of kind of, you know, re release that comes when we let go of a negative mind state or um, a problem dissolves um, and, or we let go of a piece of suffering. And that's a taste of that same flavor. You know, just like the Buddha said, all these teachings have the same flavor of, of freedom. And that's useful to keep in mind because this term vimuti, release, is used in many different contexts. There's release through uh, loving kindness, there's release through compassion, there's release through the silence liberation of mind. Um, and the point is you can kind of feel that sense of expansion and putting down in, in all those moments of the mind and in meditation. Um, so, you know, when one really manages to cultivate that warm glow of metta we were cultivating at the beginning, um, there is a sense of releasing into a wider field of awareness that's cool and loving and with way less suffering involved than our usual state. And that is a taste of release, and it is one type of release, even if it's not capital R. Um, but it, it's a taste. And, you know, similarly say when breath meditation becomes very refined, you know, every process of putting down dukkha, of seeing it and letting it go, involves the same moment of letting, release into something larger. So that can be as simple as, um, if meditation becomes somewhat refined with breath, then there can come a point where the body begins to feel really hot and awareness feels constricted because it's become refined enough, it's tired of being kind of conceptualized as trapped in this frame. And in that case, there's this, uh, you can turn your attention towards the space around the body, and suddenly you've let go of this sort of residual perception of the body as just this limited frame and released into a larger, more refined object. And, and almost every aspect of, the, of our practice has that quality.
of releasing into something larger, which is essentially the Four Noble Truths that work. We see suffering, we put it down, we realize some measure of peace. So, yeah, it's little L and there's big L hidden behind all that eventually, hopefully, for all of us. I think we have time for one more topic or question. Yeah, Roya. Uh, the question is, is the fifth precept about no dancing or no singing? Yeah. The eighth. Oh, that's the eighth. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, the question is, uh, in the eighth precept, there's an admonition against dancing and singing. And uh, the questioner is saying that mindful movement's been a big part of her practice. And it's rare she has a visceral reaction to the Buddhist teachings, but this might be one instance. Um, well, first of all, the, the basis that the Buddha gave is sort of the grounding of your life as a human being is the five precepts. and. He said, one who doesn't keep those digs out the very roots of their humanity. Um, so that's a pretty strong <coughs> phrase. And, uh, you know, fair enough, even the fifth around intoxication, you know, in, in the Buddhist conception, this chance to cultivate mindfulness and wisdom is so rare and so precious that you never want to compromise it. It's, it's absolutely sacred. But the eight precepts are something the Buddha recommended uh, lay people take on at least once, once a week or, on the, or once every two weeks on full moon and new moon days, which are basically the Sabbath. And they're just refinements. They aren't the same as these basics of our practice, but they help with the formal practice. So uh, the additional three precepts, in, well, first the third precept is transformed into complete abstinence. So no sexual conduct whatsoever on that day. Um, then one doesn't, uh, eat afternoon, except for like, you know, some sugar if you want. Um, and one doesn't dance or sing or wear adornment. And one doesn't sleep on higher luxurious sleeping places. So I'm glad you didn't have a visceral reaction to that one, Roy. Um, <laughs> so uh, these help practice, you know, not eating afternoon, it simplifies uh, your day. You don't have to worry about, you know, socializing with people over dinner. You can just go to your room and meditate. Your body and mind will be light and bright by the evening because you aren't digesting. And similarly, yes, we do raise up music a lot in the West, partly because I think it's been one of our few roots to spiritual feeling because we don't have meditation strongly in our culture. So it's kind of been invested with this authority maybe it doesn't deserve. I mean, there's a lot of musicians who are not so wise, Kurt Cobain, etc. And um, I think, uh, yeah, has anyone ever had a song stuck in their head for meditation? Anyone? Hands? Yeah? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, this is, I think we went to Fauntleroy Church where we're having the January 8th retreat to do reconnaissance, or not reconnaissance, but to um, uh, go to one of their sermons. Uh, earlier this year, and they had one ukulele song, Over the Rainbow, and for like three weeks, because I haven't listened to music in a long time, it was like every meditation. Um, so, you know, it's not like music is wrong in that way, it's just, it's not necessary. And eventually the world becomes your own music, in a sense, you know. Um, and it, if you are cultivating these refined states, little things do throw you for a loop, you know, um, and you need to be really, really careful about keeping things very still. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you, you know, that Im impulse towards dancing, um, full length prostrations are pretty fun, you know, so I'm just saying it's an alternate. But I do find that that drive towards creativity and beauty, you can channel it even with the eight precepts on days you take that. Like I, I write poetry 
things like that. And the other days, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world to dance or to sing. I'm, I'm not allowed to as a monk, but otherwise, you know. Thank you, Roya.